Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the IIEA webinar, which is part of the Global Europe Project, uh, supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. We're particularly welcome and delighted to be joined today by Commissioner Ilde Johansson, the European Commissioner for Home Affairs, who has been generous enough to take time out of her schedule to speak to us. Uh, Commissioner Johansson will speak to us on asylum and migration and asylum in the EU for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to question and answer with the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you are well aware of, I think, at this stage, it's on your screen, and please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session um, as they occur to you, and we will come to them when Commissioner Johansson has finished her presentation. Just a reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. And please feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're also live streaming this morning's discussion. Uh, so a very warm welcome to all of you who are tuning in via YouTube. Uh, just to introduce now the commissioner to you. Uh, firstly, to mention that uh, Commissioner Johansson, as um, Commissioner for Home Affairs, has a, a very wide brief. She deals, obviously, with migration and asylum, uh, security in the EU uh, on external borders, which includes um, Schengen and uh, visas, etc., and also relations uh, with third countries in the area of security. The Commissioner will update us on um, the considerable uh, progress that has been made in the area of asylum and migration. And that's particularly true, I think, Commissioner, in the, in the past year, uh, during uh, 2023. Uh, and asylum and migration, of course, are one of the foremost challenges of our era and are definitely uh, to uh, up in the same um, importance and challenge as climate change, global insecurity. So we will um, be very interested to hear the moves that have been made in this regard. Now, let me just formally uh, introduce Commissioner Johansson and hand over to her. Uh, Commissioner Johansson was appointed European Commissioner for Home Affairs in December 2019. And she previously served as Minister for Employment in the Swedish government from 2014 to 2019. Minister for Welfare and Elderly Healthcare from 2004 to 2006, and Minister for Schools from 1994 to 1998. Um, Commissioner Johansson was educated at Lund University and the Stockholm Institute of Education. So without further ado, uh, I will hand over to the Commissioner. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you on this extremely important topic. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I would like to start by reminding us all that when we talk about uh, migrants and refugees, we are talking about people, human beings. And I would like to start to say a few words on a young uh, girl. Her name is Slava. She lives now in, in uh, Ireland. She was six years old when she had to flee Putin's rockets and she found a welcome home in Ireland and a school in Dublin just two weeks after the Russian invasion. She was so scared the first day. She would not let go of her mother. But now, one year later, 16,000 16, Ukrainian children are enrolled in Irish schools, 90% of five to 12 years old. That's very impressive and that's one of the highest rates in Europe. And you can rest assured that these Ukrainian boys and girls will never forget their time with you. Learning and playing with Irish boys and girls. It reminds actually Operation Shamrock when Ireland welcomed children from France and Germany and other countries after the Second World War. Nearly 80 years later, those children, now old men and women, still remember their time in Ireland. So you can be sure that after Putin loses the war and Ukraine joins the European Union, these Ukrainian children will tell their children and grandchildren about the strong bonds of friendship with their Irish classmates and their families. 
I wanted to start with this because it's important to talk about human beings. And I would like, I will go into the update on the latest development on the Pact on Migration and Asylum. But before doing that, I would also like to give you a little bit of an overview when it comes to migration on a European level. Every year to the European Union, we have around 3 million migrants coming legally that get a residence permit in the European Union. 3 million per year. They come because they are falling in love in the EU citizens or because they are here to study or to do research or to work. Uh, part half of them are coming for, for work purposes, actually. And every year, around one, one and a half million uh, Europeans are leaving the EU, mainly because they have fallen in love in a person outside the EU or to study or to work or to do research. So this is the normal migration flows, means that we grow with approximately one and a half million people per year on legal migration, and this works very well. Every year around 700,000 third country national uh, gets an EU citizenship. That means that many of those are staying here for a long time and really being part of our society. Last year, we had 330,000 irregular arrivals, which was higher than the years before. And this is really um, an area of concern, and I'll come back to that. We had 330,000 irregular arrivals. At the same time, we had 1 million asylum application last year in the European Union, three times more than the irregular arrivals. That means that the majority of those applying for asylum are arriving legally. They are coming visa free, or they are coming on visas and overstay and apply for asylum, or they already have a residence permit or a um, um, refugee status in one member state and then go to another member state and apply for asylum. So these are the, the overall um, um, figures. Uh, uh, on the migration in European Union. So what is important for me when I took this uh, office in December 2019, uh, migration is something normal. Migration has always existed. Migration will always exist. Migration will never stop. Our task is to manage migration. And migration is manageable but it takes that we work close together to manage migration. And when I took office, uh, it was a situation in the EU where there were uh, a lot of, there were uh, the whole um, area of um, policy making and legislation was totally blocked. It's been a stalemate for many years. There was also a situation where there were lack of trust between member states and between member states and the commission. And if you allow me, I think there was also a situation there were a lot of room uh, for maneuver for um, drama queens or drama kings to make uh, a lot of noise around migration. So that was my task. I was tasked by Ursula von der Leyen to unblock the block situation and find an agreement on the new pact on migration and asylum. And I realized that the first thing necessary was to rebuild trust and try to understand uh, the different um, positions from different member states, but also for other stakeholders, from NGOs, from UN organizations, from the European Parliament, of course. So I started traveling to all capitals and reaching out to all stakeholders to understand the situation. And what I learned is that all member states are very occupied with the challenges they are facing when it comes to migration. And there was a situation that they were not so much aware of challenges that others are facing, even though these challenges are very much linked to each other. So that's how I worked to present my new pact on migration and asylum that I presented in September in 2020. And when I presented this proposal, it's a huge one, it's 11 legislative, uh, legislative files in the whole pact. So it's a huge one. Uh, 
And when I presented it, nobody was really happy. And I was asked how I see this reaction. And I think it was a great success. <laughs> Why? Because nobody rejected. It was a situation where all stakeholders say, said more or less, OK, maybe this is not really what I wanted, but this is worth looking into and start negotiating on. And I think this has been part of the uh, success that we have reached so far, that uh, this has not been rejected, this has not been blocked. It was a balanced proposal that everybody, more or less, from different perspective, thought it was worth uh, working on. So that, that what we have been doing, of course, with all the, the legislative uh, negotiations and works and going into the nitty gritty and details on all the files, both in council and parliament. But to be able to reach uh, uh, agreements, it was necessary to rebuild trust, as I said. And that means that we had to deal with all the migration challenges that we are faced with. And just to mention a few that's been since I took office in December 2019. When I took office, there were 42,000 migrants on the, living on the Greek islands, under the olive trees, more or less, uh, under unacceptable conditions. You remember that? And then only a few months later, uh, we saw uh, from Turkey, from Erdogan, that tried to say that he will open the borders to send migrants to European Union. A few, uh, then the COVID happened, and a few months later, the whole big camp Moria on Lesbos was burnt down, down in, to, totally. And I managed to get member states to step in to do voluntary returns, especially of unaccompanied minors, but also families with six children. And more than 5,000 has been relocated from, from that um, respect. And we set up a lot of support uh, for building better capacities um, uh, in Greece. Then we also had the Lukashenko who tried to instrumentalize migrants. And it, this is still ongoing more or less sending, uh, selling tickets to the European Union, tickets not for him to sell, uh, saying that I can buy, you can buy this ticket from a state to be uh, transferred into the European Union through the borders via Belarus to the neighboring countries. We have been dealing with that and we managed, especially while we reached out to third country and to uh, airline companies. It's been more or less under, under control, but we see a rise now via Russia, um, really. And Lukashenko is really going from bad to worse, I should say, when it comes to his cooperation with, with Putin. We saw a huge increase uh, of arrivals to the Canary Islands. And this is the most deadly route towards the European Union. A lot of these small Cayucos left from Morocco, from Mauritania, from Senegal, and a lot of lives lost. We managed uh, to get um, this situation as well. And now we have much fewer arrivals along these deadly routes, uh, thanks to good cooperation with uh, third countries like Morocco, Senegal, and Mauritania. We had uh, last uh, fall um, a, a huge increase along the Western Balkan route, mainly because of uh, visa-free traveling into <laughs> Serbia. We saw a huge increase of asylum uh, uh, applicants from India, from Cu Cuba, from Burundi, people that could uh, travel visa-free to Serbia. We reached out uh, uh, jointly, member states and commission, and now the flows uh, and the arrivals via the Western Balkan routes is going down significantly. Right now, we have a huge challenge with the central med route. This is also a very deadly route where we've seen a huge increase of um, departures from Tunisia and Libya. And just yesterday, uh, my president was in Tunis uh, and also managed to uh, arrange, um, agree on a memorandum of understanding uh, together with, with Tunisia in a comprehensive way. And on top of that, we have managed, we are managing the biggest refugee crisis since the Second World War a war in Ukraine with more than 4 million Ukrainian displaced persons 
in the European Union. And we managed to activate the temporary protection directive that's been there for 20 years, but never been used. And we are, of course, supporting member states heavily also on this. These are just a few examples. On that, we also had a Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, uh, where member states stepped up and helped a lot of uh, Afghan refugees on humanitarian admission into the European Union. Why am I mentioning this? I think that uh, the way we are managing migration challenges and sometimes even crisis together, Commission and member states jointly, is a way to build trust. And without this, it would not have been possible to reach the agreement that we have so far when it comes to the Pact on Migration and Asylum. And I should also say that we would not have been able to activate the Temporary Protection Directive either without uh, these um, work on trust building uh, and showing that migration is manageable if and when we work together and also when we work together with with partners outside the European Union and, of course, international partners uh, as well. And where are we now on the Pact on Migration and Asylum? I said that there's 11 legislative files. Five are already concluded. Four of them are now in trialogue, which is the legislative process where Parliament and Council negotiate. There was a major breakthrough on the 8th of June when the council managed to find a, um, a common approach on two very big, very difficult and sensitive files uh, on responsibility and solidarity, the so-called asylum procedures uh, regulation and the managing migration regulation or something, AMMR is called. Um, so that was a major big breakthrough. So now we have four trialogues ongoing in a very constructive uh, spirit between Council and Parliament. And we have two more to start negotiations. One is the crisis proposal where Council need to find their position and the Spanish presidency aim at a um, common approach on the 26th of July on the crisis proposal. Of course, to be seen, but then trialogue can start on that as well. Then we have the return directive where council have a, have a position, but parliament does not have a position yet. So hopefully they will have a position in the beginning of September and then trial can start on that as well. So what we are aiming at is to conclude these remaining six ones uh, before, hopefully before the end of this year, before the end of the Spanish presidency, to have the, the months uh, in uh, 2020, next year, uh, before Parliament split to have the formal decisions so that the whole pact could be agreed together during this mandate. Will that happen? Yes, I think so. But of course, fingers crossed and all that, uh, it's uh, always a uh, heavy work to, uh, to have this trust and to have these uh, negotiations. But so far, we have had a a broad and solid majority in the council because it, the decision has been taken by a qualified majority. And also in parliament, most of the file has been agreed upon between the three big political groups. And I think this is also important that we are not finding uh, the, the um, compromises uh, and at the end of any political spectrum. Uh, so we are really finding uh, a comprehensive approach will um, that will lead to a better uh, protection of our external border making sure that those that are not eligible for uh, protection will have a swifter process and a swifter return decision because this is important that those not eligible to stay also have to be returned to the country of origin at the same time a better protection of the individual rights and especially for the vulnerable ones, for children, for other vulnerable groups in protection of their rights and their reception uh, facilities, for example, to have the proper uh, system. It also, and now for the first time ever, Council has agreed on numbers for relocation and for mandatory solidarity between member states. And I think this is a very, very uh, important step. There are a lot of, of details, of course, I'm happy to, to answer that. Uh, but, but overall, we are, we are very close to a situation uh, 
where we have overcome the block situation and can deliver a more modern, a more European and a more comprehensive uh, pact uh, an agreement and the legislative uh, agreement uh, on the manage to manage migration and asylum. But on top of that, we need to continue to work closely together with third countries, countries of origin, countries of transit, countries along the routes, so that we do not wait until we have uh, people uh, suffering at our borders that we reach out even earlier. And this is also a very important part, even if it's not really in the legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for that overview. And I think um, you deserve uh, a great a great support and um, wonderful acknowledgement of the um, progress you have achieved since uh, 2020 uh, in taking this difficult topic from the, the national to the European. Uh, and that has been uh, an amazing uh, success and as we have seen uh, in the uh, Justice Council and the European Council. Um, we will go to question and answer. Um, and uh, before doing that, may I ask uh, anybody who has a question, if they could um, indicate their name and affiliation. I should mention that we have to finish at 20 past four. So I would be grateful if the questions could be short and um, uh, so that we can get in as many as possible. Just before we go to the um, uh, questioners, um, Commissioner, I just have a, um, would ask your view on the um, outcome of the last uh, European Council where Poland and Hungary uh, did not accept um, the proposal and therefore it could not feature in the Council conclusions. Uh, you have spoken about using the majority voting and that this uh, the Constitution allows that. Could you just tell us what the situation is and will we be able to move forward on your plan uh, in this in this regard? Yes, we will be able to move forward. According to the treaty, we should take decisions on migration with qualified majority. And that's what we do in the Justice and Home Affairs Council. And uh, when we had this breakthrough uh, agreement, only two member states voted against. And I think that was a big uh, success, actually, to have that solid majority. Uh, in the European Council, they take the conclusions with, with unanimously, unanimously. So that is um, uh, more, more difficult. But the decisions are taken with qualified majority. And that is what the treaty says that we uh, should do. And I think really uh, it's not a good idea to have uh, a veto system when it comes to these important uh, issues that it's uh, really necessary that Europe manage together. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I hope that um, that can move forward. Uh, just some questions uh, that have come in uh, from the from listeners. Uh, Nora Owen, who is a former Irish Minister for Justice, asks, what is the current status of the Dublin Convention? Is it still in full use at the moment? Yes, it's still valid, the Dublin Convention, and it's uh, being uh, used. Uh, uh, there was sh huge hiccups uh, during pandemic. I must say. So we are, have now agreed with all the 27 member states on a roadmap back to Dublin, to uh, step by step uh, going back to a more functioning Dublin system. So it's still there. In the, my proposal on a new pact of migration and asylum, there are changes in the, in the Dublin regulation. And uh, if you look at the uh, agreement reached by uh, uh, council, they have even bigger changes. Of course, this needs now to be negotiated with, with the parliament. So, but I think there's a good guess that the outcome will be that we'll still have a Dublin uh, system, but there will be some significant changes also into the system after we have finalized the, the negotiations between the co-legislators. Thank you. Thank you for that. Another question from uh, Francesco Pinotti, advisor of the Council of Europe, uh, asks, will clear human rights safeguards be included in the cooperation agreement with Tunisia? So maybe you could tell us, I know yesterday, uh, it's, it's a very recently signed agreement, but maybe you could speak a bit about the agreement that has been signed with Tunisia, because I know there was a, 
uh, there were difficulties with this agreement, but obviously uh, these have been overcome. But the question regards uh, human rights safeguards in the agreement with Tunisia. So the uh, memorandum of understanding is a very comprehensive one that covers five different areas, not only migration, but a lot of other areas. And it was signed yesterday, as, as you said. I will be uh, giving a statement and answer question on this in Parliament tomorrow. And uh, that will be will be my moment uh, on that. But uh, of course, it's it's always important uh, for us uh, to, especially when it comes to the individuals um, uh, migrants to uh, always prioritize uh, the fundamental rights. Thank you. Thank you for that, that assurance. Um, former retired officer Brigadier General Ahern um, asks, is there a risk uh, emerging of Frontex being perceived as a bad actor regarding uncontrolled refugee and migrant entry into the EU? I know that the role of Frontex is going to be uh, considerably extended and including outside the EU. So perhaps you could mention, um, have a word about the role of Frontex. Yes, uh, it's not a secret that there have been a lot of criticism and rightly so, I should say, about how uh, uh, Frontex uh, acted previously. And out of that, actually, the outcome was that the executive director and also others uh, resigned. And now we have a totally new leadership uh, in the Frontex with a new executive director, three excellent deputy uh, executive directors. We have a, um, a fully fledged fundamental rights officer in place with all the 40 fundamental rights monitors in Frontex. And I must say that I'm very satisfied with how Frontex are dealing with a difficult situation that of course can occur uh, at our um, external borders. And I must say that uh, I think it's very important that we have Frontex. Uh, Frontex are also the European eyes and ears at our borders. Uh, and I think that uh, this is something that has been uh, recognized and also something that, for example, uh, with this recent uh, terrible tragedy with the shipwreck outside the Greek uh, coast, I think I hear many voices uh, that ask for even more presence of Frontex uh, at these um, situations. Thank you, Commissioner. Just a supplementary question on that. You mentioned the Balkan route. Uh, do you think this extension of Frontex uh, mandate will have an impact on the uh, in um, improving the situation on the Balkan route for refugees? Yes, it has. Uh, we have now uh, agreed new agree uh, signed new agreement with several of the Balkan partners and Frontex are deployed at many of the borders right now. And this is really a win-win situation where uh, Frontex uh, officers are supporting uh, the, the national uh, border guards, uh, but also it's a learning situation. This is also a way for the Balkans to be more prepared for their path towards an EU membership on how we should protect our borders, how we should protect fundamental rights our, at our borders, and how we work jointly uh, on, on this. And especially when we see, uh, we see actually a lot of, uh, not only migrants are being uh, smuggled, we see also a lot of cross-border crime. Organized criminal groups are unfortunately quite present also on the Western Balkans. We see fraud documents, we see smuggling of, um, drugs, of weapons, some of these weapons ends up uh, in the streets of, of the EU member states. So it's uh, increasingly important that we support the Balkan partners on increasing and developing their law enforcement, both when they, on legislation, but also on the um, practice on the ground. Yes, thank you for that. Um, the, <clears throat> the next question relates to third countries and the EU um, relationships with third countries, which falls, I know, very much into your, uh, into your mandate. And uh, Valerie Hughes, who's a friend of the Syrian community in Ireland, asks about reports of people being disappeared at the Syrian border and asks uh, what the EU is doing to protect Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Turkey from being sent back to Syria. I don't know if 
the uh, EU responsibility would extend to that kind of oversight? No, it's it's true that there are limits to what we can uh, we can do from from the from the Commission or from the EU. Uh, but for example, uh, one thing is that we are supporting Syrian refugees in Turkey. They are hosting almost four million uh, Syrian refugees in in Turkey, and one reason to do that is that we will not support them being sent back uh, to Syria. So this is a way we can work on it, but uh, it's also true that uh, we can't be, uh, we are not a, a world police. <laughs> so we can, we, via our support and our agreements, um, of course we um, will, will, um, will not agree of uh, people being uh, treated uh, not according to their rights or being sent to, to dangerous uh, areas, uh, but um, we can't. We, we, it's not realistic to see that we can prevent everything of this to happen anywhere in the world either. Yes, yes, the mandate is quite extensive, uh, and um, uh, it's it's difficult, as you say, um, even in the most egregious circumstances, to to extend the EU mandate. I have a couple of questions, uh, Commissioner, on the uh, voluntary solidarity mechanism from Ruhi Ahmad, a uh, program director in Griffith College, Dublin, and um, uh, a student, Jakob Chulpek. Um, uh, the, um, the question of the solidarity mechanism. Um, how do you, how do you, sh uh, could you share your thoughts on how you see the future of the solidarity mechanism? Because this has been uh, a point of, of some difficulty. Yes, uh, of course, this is part now of the trialogue, the negotiations between Parliament and Council. And uh, so this has to be finalized. But I can see that in my proposal, I proposed a mandatory solidarity when a member state is under pressure and need support from other member states, other member states should be obliged to step in to support. The council general approach supports this. And it, the council general approach is also very clear that uh, the member state that would provide solidarity to another member state can choose by themselves what kind of solidarity. It could be relocation, it could be financial contribution, it could be in-kind contribution. So this and, and the different kind of contribution should be equally valid, um, val valued. Uh, so so it's, uh, there is not any mandatory relocation, but a mandatory solidarity where member states can choose what kind of solidarity. What is, I think, a good improvement uh, that uh, what made uh, in the uh, council uh, general approach is also that they made clear that if the member state themselves are under pressure. So take, for example, countries like Czech Republic and Poland right now hosting so many Ukrainian displaced person. If you are in that position, you are not obliged to take part in uh, solidarity me uh, measures towards another member states. We could also be benefiting yourself from solidarity uh, measures. So I think this was important and this was a bit of lessons learned from the, from the war and all the Ukrainian refugees, that it's important that uh, a member state that are doing a lot in another part of migration management, uh, will not be uh, obliged to take part in the mandatory solidarity towards another member state that is under pressure for other reasons. Thank you. I think you've already answered the question that Jakob Chulup uh, had asked uh, on behalf of, of Czechia, of the Czech Republic, I think, uh, uh, because of the number of, um, uh, of migrants that they have um, and the refugees they have taken in. You have mentioned that uh, there's an exemption for the moment uh, from, from the solidarity clause. Um, the, uh, the um, you recently signed, very recently signed um, a pact with a security pact with uh, Moldova between the EU and Moldova, uh, which uh, you have um, 
uh, praised for obvious reasons as uh, likely to be very significant and, and a success. Do you see this as, as um, an example of other types of security cooperation in the migration area? No, uh, not really. Uh, this is specifically on security and, uh, and not specifically on, on migration. And the reason uh, is, of course, is, is two or threefold. One, uh, Moldova is one of the weakest uh, um, European countries when it comes to, to security. And they are so close and so much affected by the Russian uh, invasion in Ukraine. They may be one of those most affected by Russian propaganda and the risk of, of Russians reaching out also to, to Moldova, especially with the situation with Transnistria, as, as you know. And Moldova is also a candidate country uh, that will become hopefully um, a, an EU uh, member. So for many reasons, there are many reasons why we should, uh, I wanted to answer positively to the request from the Moldovan Minister of Interior to support them when it comes to internal security. And that's uh, what also what we are doing with our agencies, with Europol, with Frontex, with CEPOL, uh, but, uh, but also I reached out to member states and now member states are also supporting. There's a lot of equipment they need. There are a lot of expertise they need. And this, and this brings together in this security hub. And that has been uh, it's exactly one year since we launched it. And I think it's been really successful so far. So it's have proven that we can together support Moldova significantly without very big efforts on our side. But when we join our forces, the agencies, the commission, the member states, and we have such a um, good uh, partner uh, in, in Moldova that really would like to work closely with us on the internal security aspect. This has been a, this has been a very good, good example. I'm working also very close with, with Ukraine on uh, internal security, especially on um, preventing trafficking of human beings, preventing firearms trafficking. But of course, it's a totally different situation because they are at war. Uh, but I think uh, having more comprehensive security cooperation especially with countries on the in EU path. Uh, we also have it with several of the Western Balkan countries because to be able to reach the standard, the EU standard uh, on, in law enforcement for, for many uh, countries, this is a significant steps that need to be taken both on the judicial and on the, um, on the, on the police cooperation, for example, when it comes to legislation. So it's important that we, that we support them in this. Thank you, Commissioner, for that. Um, I have a number of questions on third countries and safe third countries, and I think you're working with the uh, refugee, uh, the, some of the refugee agencies in relation to safe third countries. But this is an issue that I think is, is of um, uh, importance to quite a number of people. How will the EU designate safe countries for refugee return? So today, member states decide themselves uh, if they consider a third country a safe third country. If a country is considered a safe third country, then a person coming from that country, uh, a citizen in that country, uh, their um, asylum request could be seen as inadmissible. So this is how it works. Uh, I have proposed that we should have an EU-wide definition of safe third countries. Hopefully that uh, co-legislators will agree on that, but we are not there yet. Uh, if we agree on a European definition of safe third countries, it means that uh, people um, uh, that coming from, from that country have, uh, are, are safe uh, in that country. Uh, and, and uh, that uh, should not um, be um, their uh, asylum application should be seen uh, in inadmissible. But but this definition has not been decided uh, yet. But part of it, of course, is uh, uh, how well functioning uh, the uh, protection 
uh, the protection of fundamental rights, the right to apply for asylum and to be given international protection, for example, it's also part that has to be assessed in that context. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Just also to follow up on that, there will be a question of uh, sending uh, migrants to other countries um, besides their their one their countries of origin, and that is a provision as well. Is that the case? This is not in my proposal. This is not in the proposal and the common uh, general approach of the of the Council. It's not in the Parliament position. Uh, so, and uh, I must also say that I'm not in favor of that. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea uh, to send asylum um, applicants uh, to uh, a third uh, country. But it's not in my proposal and it's not in the Council uh, general approach and it's not in the Parliament position. So I will be very surprised if that would be the outcome of the uh, negotiations. We can take that assurance, thank you. And uh, just uh, another um, series of questions. I have actually three more questions on Tunisia from people who are worried about um, the policies of the Tunisian regime, uh, the abandonment of hundreds of migrants in the Tunisian desert from Jane Ann McKenna, who's the uh, chief executive officer of the NGO DOCUS. And how will the EU ensure that the fundamental human rights of individuals seeking asylum will be upheld in their partnerships agreement? Uh, you've mentioned uh, already that there is a provision, but uh, do we have the ability to oversee um, uh, that, that we can uphold the, the um, uh, standards of human rights in that agreement? Well, Tunisia is a long-standing long strategic partner to the EU and also to several, I think, maybe all of the uh, member states of the, of the EU. And it's clear that there are a lot of challenges and that's why we would like to work even closer with Tunisia to address this. And that's why my president was there yesterday to sign this memorandum of understanding. I was in Tunisia the, the third time during my mandate, um, one and a half months ago where we discussed specifically on the migration uh, part. And uh, what is uh, what we agree then is that we should work together with Tunisia when it comes to um, uh, those that would like, that are present in Tunisia and that would like to voluntarily return to the country of origin, that we should support that and the, that uh, via IOM and the reintegration of uh, these third countries, that Tunisians, Tunisia should welcome back Tunisian citizens that are not eligible to stay in the European Union um, to, to return to Tunisia, that we should support Tunisia when it comes to the prevention of these dangerous, mostly deadly uh, departures uh, on these uh, boats, that we should work together uh, on the identification of migrants and that we should jointly invest in legal pathways, what we call talent partnership together. And I think this is the way to work uh, on a comprehensive way on migration. Thank you for uh, thank you for the uh, frank answer on that. Um, Commissioner, I think uh, I probably speak for a lot of people in Ireland who uh, wonder what can be done or how can the EU assist in stopping the uh, smuggling uh, of migrants and asylum seekers. Um, we watch every day the huge numbers crossing uh, in the various, um, uh, along the various routes. And uh, there are smugglers involved, there is huge money involved. Uh, is it difficult for the EU, do we feel more or less helpless in front of these um, uh, smugglers who are ever more ingenious, uh, ever more active, uh, um, more journeys. Uh, what is your view in terms of trying to deal with the smuggling? Because I think that's something that uh, people are really um, uh, concerned about. Yes, and I think we should be concerned. I think it's extremely important that we remember uh, that's why I started. Migrants are human beings. They're men, women, and children. It could have been me. It could have been us uh, that are in a situation where they might be desperate to search for a better future or for protection. So I think uh, the day we uh, stop being uh, upset or concerned about lives being lost, 
we have lost something important of being a human being. So, so this is important. Our first obligation is always to save lives. And to be able to do that, we need to do different things. So, for example, on these deadly routes uh, right now on the Central Med, we have been quite successful on the Atlantic, as I started to say, but now we see it on the Central Med. And these smuggling networks, they are very professional. Many of those have links to different countries. And that's why I went to Pakistan and to Bangladesh to work together with them because we see a lot of Bangladeshis and Pakistanis along these routes on the Central Med uh, also and on this terrible tragedy with the shipwreck outside Greece there could have been three to four hundred Pakistanis that actually lost their life there was on the bottom of this um, uh, ship in the belly and, and that was a huge, huge tragedy. So it's important to work already from the countries of origin, but then also to work with countries of transit. And this is part of the cooperation, for example, with Tunisia, that we should be able to exchange also data between police uh, to go after these criminal networks. We have seen, especially on the Atlantics, actually quite successful uh, police cooperation on cracking down on the smugglers. And this we need to do uh, even more. But we also need to do a search and rescue when we need to prevent the, the, this unseaworthy vessel to depart. But if they depart, people need to be rescued. Uh, we always have to prioritize um, uh, saving lives. But to also to prevent more people from going here, I think it's important to in parallel invest in legal pathways. We are an aging society in the European Union. We need workforces from younger societies. And this we should also be better at investing in good pathways for people to come here also legally to uh, contribute to our econ economy. And this is what we are doing with talent partnership. So unfortunately, there is no quick fix. So we need a comprehensive approach. But uh, I think where you started, uh, the day we start to be very upset and concerned, we have lost something really important. So we should not do that. And we should never accept this to be a normal situation. Thank you, Commissioner. That's uh, very clear. And as a very last question, it is in fact related to your last point. Jill Donahue, who is the Deputy Director General of the Institute, said, what role for data sharing in managing secondary movement can the proposed interoperability of Frontex and police databases be of assistance in tracking migrants? It's a question of interoperability of data. And uh, presumably the, the more of that, uh, the more successful uh, can the um, tracking be of, of migrants and uh, movements as, as a very last question. Yeah, there are different parts uh, in, uh, in this question. One is when we talk about secondary movement inside the European Union, then it's important with my proposal on the new Eurodac, where we will have more proper data, especially also to protect children that sometimes go missing. Uh, migrant children. It's important that we really have the information on each individual and to, can make sure that no child will be will be missing. So, so that is it's not an exchange of data, but it's more of a having um, the proper statistics on each individual uh, that is there. When it comes to protect protection of our borders, um, it's not really an exchange of data, but it's. Um, um, working together uh, on the specific routes that are there. Where we really need the exchange of personal data is for police cooperation. And that is when a national police or Europol are exchanging data with a third country police. And that for to be able to do that, we need a special status agreement to, so that we can also uh, stand up to our high standards of data protection. But I think this is necessary to be able to go after the top level of these smugglers. We have to remember that these smugglers are not sending people to Europe. They are sending them to death. And sometimes they are actually even forced uh, into uh, the, the vessels, even the, when the, the weather conditions are really, really dangerous. So uh, it's important that we not do not only go after uh, the smugglers, uh, on the on the ground, but also for this top level uh, of these that really earns all the money 
of this uh, cynic um, business. And for that, we need police cooperation. And for that, we need a status agreement for exchanging of data with Europol and third country police. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Commissioner, that's a very chilling end to our discussion. But we owe you a great debt of gratitude for being so um, comprehensive and frank with us about the challenges uh, that you face. But also, I think um, it's very heartening to hear the, of the progress that has been made. And um, uh, we can just wish you well in something that is of huge importance uh, to um, all the member states of the EU um, and, uh, and to um, internationally. Um, because this, this is one of the difficult and most challenging um, issues. And uh, uh, we thank you again for joining us today to explain the challenges, but also the progress that has been made. So thank you most sincerely. And, uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.